Since I started this channel nearly two years ago, I've made a considerable number of acids. At this point, I've made hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, phosphoric acid, sulfuric acid, nitric acid, acetic acid, boric acid, and a variety of organic acids. However, in all that time, there are still three major acids I still haven't made. Perchloric acid, hydrofluoric acid, and hydroiodic acid. As of now, I'm still not certain I'll ever make hydrofluoric acid, as I do like being alive, and most of my attempts at making perchloric acid fail, as my anodes just kind of get eaten. In the meantime, however, I figured I might as well make hydroiodic acid if for no other reason than to check off another DEA List 1 chemical. Honestly, somebody out there should make a DEA List 1 bingo for chemistry YouTubers, I'm just too lazy to do it myself. Anyway, the reason I've never made hydroiodic acid really has nothing to do with its placement on any government surveillance list. As I've pointed out before, all federally listed chemicals are completely legal to make and own, as long as you aren't stupid or irresponsible about it. With that said, the real reason I've never made hydroiodic acid is because I've simply never needed it for any project I've ever done. There's a few reasons for this that I'll get into in a minute, but for now, let's go ahead and start making some. Now to get started, I simply added 20 grams of potassium iodide, 20 milliliters of 85% phosphoric acid, and 20 milliliters of distilled water to a 250 milliliter round bottom boiling flask. I chose to use potassium iodide here as it tends to be the most readily available, but any iodide salt will do. The idea here is to produce the hydroiodic acid by a displacement reaction with phosphoric acid, which is used in large excess here along with water. You can see as I add the phosphoric acid that the mixture begins to yellow, and this is due to the formation of tiny amounts of elemental iodine. This occurs because some hydroiodic acid is immediately formed when the phosphoric acid comes in contact with the iodide salt. Hydroiodic acid itself is such a strong reducing agent that it will immediately react with oxygen in the air to form iodine and water. Anyway, this is next set up for a basic distillation and heated as strongly as my heating mantle could manage under constant stirring. Once hydroiodic acid begins to distill over, the heat is then reduced so that about one drop per second is distilling over. Now, as a rule of thumb, you can really only make acids by displacement with another acid if the starting acid is stronger than the acid you want to make. Seeing as how phosphoric acid is 100 billion times weaker than hydroiodic acid, this reaction shouldn't be possible on paper. However, as is often the case, chemistry is a lot more complicated than that, and there are many other factors that determine whether a reaction will proceed. Principally among these are enthalpy and entropy. Thermodynamically speaking, this reaction has a fairly large negative enthalpy value. This means that the reaction is thermodynamically possible and favored over the reactants. Secondly, the products of this reaction have a greater entropy than the reactants, making this reaction spontaneous at any temperature. That being said, the purpose of applying heat here is not quite the same as it was when I was making nitric acid using sulfuric acid and sodium nitrate. In that case, the application of heat forces a thermodynamically unfavorable but entropically favorable second deprotonation of sulfuric acid to proceed. However, in this case, the point of the heat is to simply boil off the hydroiodic acid that's produced spontaneously when phosphoric acid reacts with potassium iodide. Now, the reason I used a large excess of water in the reaction mixture is to help guarantee that the majority of the hydroiodic acid produced distills over as its azeotrope with water. Using less or no water is possible, but the consequence is that much of the hydroiodic acid produced would be produced as hydrogen iodide gas. And this isn't a problem per se, but it would require that you include the extra step of capturing the gas in a water trap. I like to avoid this where possible, as it usually introduces the risk of suckback, which is annoying. Anyway, the excess phosphoric acid is used because the single deprotonation of phosphoric acid is much more thermodynamically favorable than the second, which allows the reaction to be conducted at a much lower temperature. This helps to minimize the risk of pyrophosphoric acid etching or destroying the reaction flask, but again, it's technically unnecessary. Anyway, after distilling for about 45 minutes, no more hydroiodic acid was distilling over, and my collection flask was nearly full. At this point, I went ahead and cut the heat and removed my flask, which began to aggressively evolve white fumes. These are fumes of hydrogen iodide gas, and this happens because the hydroiodic acid distilling over at this point contains more hydrogen iodide than the water can properly dissolve. 
I went ahead and collected these last few drops of fuming hydroiodic acid so I could demonstrate it. As you can see, the fumes of hydrogen iodide are extremely acidic and turn litmus paper red on contact. This isn't really unique and honestly identical to fuming hydrochloric or nitric acid, but since I'd never seen fuming hydroiodic acid before, I found this pretty cool regardless. Anyway, to calculate a rough final yield, I poured my hydroiodic acid into a graduated cylinder for a final mass of 35.05 grams. The acid here occupied about 28 milliliters of volume, giving it a density of 1.252 grams per milliliter at 25 degrees ambient temperature. This aligns with a concentration of around 30%. I titrated this stuff to a concentration of 2.958 moles per liter, which I calculated as 30.22% by mass, which is surprisingly close to my estimation from the density. 28 milliliters of 2.958 molar hydroiodic acid corresponds to 0.0828 moles of hydrogen iodide, which represents a 69% yield out of a hypothetical 0.12 moles. This number could be increased by simply running the distillation a little longer at a higher temperature, but again, I didn't really want to damage my flask with the hot pyrophosphoric acid. As a quick side note, as this is something I can definitely see some people asking, but you cannot substitute sulfuric acid in place of phosphoric acid for this process. This is because hydroiodic acid is such a strong reducing agent that it will reduce sulfate to sulfide and elemental iodine. Now, I mentioned earlier that I've never made hydroiodic acid before because I didn't have any use for it, and that's mostly because hydroiodic acid is fairly useless for the type of chemistry I tend to do. It also has a very poor shelf life due to the previously mentioned tendency to react with oxygen, and it's extremely slow to react with metals to the point that I couldn't even force it to react with aluminum. I was able to come up with something incredibly interesting to do with this though, and the first step was to oxidize it all to elemental iodine. This step took a little while though because the reaction is very exothermic, and so while that's going on, I'll discuss a bit more about why this acid is so difficult to use. Now, hydroiodic acid is by far the strongest of the mineral acids, with a pKa of negative 9.3. This number is absolutely insane compared to other strong acids like sulfuric acid with its pKa of negative 2 or nitric acid with its pKa of negative 1.37. This value means that hydroiodic acid is 87 million times stronger than nitric acid. But as always, chemistry is a bit more complex than stronger equals better. Specifically, acid strength is simply the degree of acid dissociation, with stronger acids dissociating more completely. All this really means is that protons are more loosely held to strong acid anions, and in aqueous solution these numbers are completely meaningless for acids with a pKa value lower than hydronium. This is because aqueous acids donate hydrogen through the intermediate formation of hydronium, and so the reaction of either nitric acid or hydrogen iodide with water will both give solutions with stoichiometric equivalents of hydronium and either iodide or nitrate respectively. In fact, a 1 molar solution of any acid with a pKa lower than 0 will form a 1 molar solution of hydronium regardless of the specific strength of the acid. This is called the leveling effect, and it's why we usually just refer to any acid with a pKa of lower than zero as being strong. However, we can prove that hydroiodic acid is stronger than nitric acid by dissolving them in a more acidic solvent than water. For example, nitric and sulfuric acid will not fully dissociate in a solution of anhydrous acetic acid, but hydroiodic acid will. So that I don't talk about it all day, I'm going to put acid strength aside for a second and look at something else. Now, since all acids donate hydrogen as their defining feature, most of their true action is actually derived from their acidic anion. As you may know, electronegativity decreases as you descend to the periodic table, and this makes the iodide ion far less electrophilic than the chloride ion, for example. This is why hydrochloric acid reacts so much better with nucleophilic metals than hydroiodic acid. Therefore, in most any case where you want an acid to act as a Lewis acid, you would want to use hydrochloric acid over hydroiodic acid. However, there are instances, particularly in organic chemistry, where you'd want your acid to be a weaker electrophile. Take, for instance, the halogenation of alkenes to alkyl halides. These reactions proceed via an EAS reaction wherein the carbocation intermediate is a strong electrophile. 
This means that the nucleophilic iodide ion will react much more readily here than chloride or fluoride. The strong reducing properties of hydroiodic acid are also incredibly useful in organic chemistry, most notably in the reduction of aromatic nitro compounds to anilines, among other things. Anyway, this is all to say that given the major uses of hydroiodic acid are for organic synthesis, and given the poor stability of this stuff, it tends to be better to make the acid in the reaction mixture rather than making it ahead of time like I showed here and then storing it. Anyway, as you've been watching during my long rant on acids, I did finally oxidize all of the hydroiodic acid to iodine, and then collected it all by vacuum filtration. Having all of this relatively pure iodine on hand, I decided I wanted to try something fascinating I read about on Reddit a few years back and really wanted to give a try. The idea is that once you have wet precipitated iodine like this, typically the best way to purify it is to sublime it. However, I read that by adding sulfuric acid to iodine, you can suppress its high vapor pressure and actually get it to melt. If this actually worked, it would allow both for the observation of liquid iodine and the formation of a big crystal of the stuff. To that end, I basically just placed 50 milliliters of sulfuric acid on ice until it had cooled well below 0 degrees Celsius, and then poured it carefully over my precipitated iodine. This did generate some heat as the sulfuric acid reacted with the excess water, and then I moved it to my hot plate to heat it up even more. After a few minutes of heating, most of the iodine melted, forming a dense layer below the sulfuric acid. It was very metallic and looked almost like mercury, which I found fascinating. At this point, I took the beaker off the heat and placed it in a water bath to cool it down and solidify the iodine. All of the iodine vapor present formed crystals on the sides of the beaker during this step, which I did my best to collect before pouring off the dirty sulfuric acid. The solid puck of iodine stuck to the bottom was rinsed a few times using ice cold water and then removed from the beaker by turning it upside down and gently tapping at the bottom. This left me with a nice, solid piece of ultra pure elemental iodine that kinda reminded me of a big coin. I played around with this for a while before I realized that I probably could have formed an even nicer looking internal crystal structure by allowing the molten iodine to cool much more slowly. To test this, I went ahead and repeated the process using fresh sulfuric acid in a smaller beaker, and then allowed it to cool down much more slowly. When I got this piece out, I found that it indeed had a much nicer internal and external crystal structure, and was an absolutely beautiful addition to my element collection. The rest of this video is basically just different shots I got of this lovely piece of iodine, and on that note, I'll go ahead and wrap this up. I hope you found this video interesting, and as always, I want to thank all my wonderful patrons for their generous contributions. Your support is vital and very appreciated. To everyone else, if you'd like to see more content like this, consider subscribing on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, or even by becoming a patron yourself. As for video updates, everything is somewhat in flux at the moment, as I recently moved and have been putting most of my free time into setting my lab space back up. As a result, my upload schedule is a bit out of whack, and I'll go ahead and display on screen here what videos I intend to put out next week. The specific order is subject to change until things calm down, but but if you'd like to see any of these, consider giving me a follow. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.